the spatial management of remotely piloted vehicles in the three elements of earth, water and air. And this seems to address to me the problem that uh, typically two objects cannot occupy the same position in space at the same time. Sounds like that. <laughs> um, Philip is also a principal fellow in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the, U Technic at the University of Melbourne, Australia. And now we again move to a different place, maybe. Uh, he is a senior member of the IEEE, and there he is also a member of the Aerospace and Electronic Systems Society, as well as the Society on Social Implications of Technology, which both address the field we hear about uh, in a few minutes or moments. He is a vice chair of the Unmanned Airborne Vehicle uh, Technical Panel, and he is also a member of the Board of Governors of the Society of on Social Implications of Technology. And I stop here, Phil. It's your word. Thank you, Jim. Five minutes to pull up by presentation. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Dita. That I um, very much appreciate. And again, it is a, it's a pleasure to be here um, and asked to uh, give a presentation at, um, at this uh, interesting conference. Um, I'm going to depart, for, depart from sort of normal um, presentation standards here and make a few, um, how can I say, um, um, bad habits of presentations. So I have a lot of slides, and the main reason for that is that there's a lot of information to cover to bring you up to speed of um, you know, the current discussions and issues around the introduction of drones as, a, as a, um, a, a toy of choice in some respects, but also its commercial um, uh, potential is, is quite huge, as you know. Very much so, uh, we regard it within IEEE as a hot topic. Um, the purpose of the uh, slide pack being fairly detailed is two. One that I have given this lecture before to uh, a lot of people from non-English speaking background and uh, so they can follow and not have to uh, follow the presentation but not necessarily have to follow my Australian accent. Um, that's one. The second one is that they're able to take the slide pack away and understand it uh, in, in its detail rather than try to memorise what the heck I was talking about on that particular point. Um, now in the time uh, frame we have, I'm going to skip over the next slide, which is basically I put in there for people to remember what I've done. And um, I think you covered just about everything uh, in my bio, except I will point out this one is the bottom one. I'm also the SSIT representative on the IEEE USA Committee for Transport and Aerospace Policy, and part of our presentation will touch on some of the work we're doing there. Okay, so this presentation, I'm going to touch on four key discussion areas, as I call them. So I'm not going to have a conclusion at the end. As I get to the end of each of this point, there's like a little, little summary or wrap-up. Um, I'm going to talk about two workshops uh, we held over the last 12 months. In fact, it's almost 12 months since we did the workshop in Melbourne. And uh, in March this year, we did one in Washington that followed on from it, where we talked about the national security and social implications of remotely piloted airborne systems and remote and related technologies. I'm going to uh, then talk a bit about, in fact, I'm going to present you with the details of the IEEE USA position statement on uh, unmanned aircraft systems and related technologies. I'll make the point here that we will use um, uh, in this presentation several different terms for the same um, subject. Drones, unmanned aircraft systems, unmanned aircraft vehicles, up hazards, RPABs, and uh, part of my presentation will actually talk about terminology. But the title of this position statement, which actually I'm the author of, um, is Unmanned Aircraft Systems. I'm going to mention also a bit about the ICAO uh, UPAS Symposium, which was held in Montreal in March this year, which I was a guest of ICAO. And for those who are not familiar with the jargon, ICAO is the UN Agency for the International Civil Aviation Organization which represents um, its member states are essentially um, the people who control our civil aviation regulations worldwide. 
I'm then going to also just briefly mention the uh, United Arid Emirates Government Drones for Good Award. Uh, the first one was held in, um, at the end of last year, which I was a judge on in February in Dubai. And um, the call for entries is now out um, for the 2016 award. A key thread I want to try to bring out in this presentation, and I appreciate that um, I, I've only got about 20 or 40 minutes uh, in total time slot for a lecture that I normally take about an hour and a half to give. Um, so we're going to flick through this pretty quick. The emphasis but on this presentation is to draw out more of the legal and civil liberty challenges that apply to consumer drone ownership. So I'm not going to touch on uh, the big stuff. So I'm really talking about these two pictures down here. It's about the size. We're talking about called small RPAZs or small UAVs. And uh, they're the typical ones you can buy that are mass produced by DGI or you can buy them online or through a hobby store. Um, or a photographer might want to buy this part of his business or a real estate agent. But we're not talking about predators or defence drones or anything like that. We are really focusing back on you as a consumer can buy it through your electronics distributor. Okay, so we, in the last 12 months we've held two international workshops. Um, the eighth workshop on social implications, national security, uh, was the eighth workshop in a series sponsored by the University of Wollongong primarily. And uh, it has different subjects. Uh, this was our subject for the eighth. Um, remotely piloted airborne vehicles and related technologies and we've carried that theme through this series of discussions on the topic. It was held in Melbourne at the end of September last year at the University of Melbourne. Uh, it was actually endorsed by SSIT, uh, sponsored by the SRT Australia chapter and, and CTAP. Uh, the other main sponsor, which is important to note, it was the Australian Council of Learned Academies, or ACOLA, under their Securing Australia Future uh, 05 project and that's sponsored by the Australian Research Council and Australian Government. Um, the other one there of interest is it was also co-sponsored by the Defence Science Institute, which is made up of the Defence Science Technology Organisation, the State of Victoria in Australia, and the University of Melbourne, and of course the University of Wollongong under its um, uh, Social Applications and National Security Workshop series. The other uh, workshop was actually a follow-on from the Melbourne one, the uh, output of Melbourne people, the attendance, participants felt were so successful, uh, particularly the American uh, participants that came out, that they wanted to do a follow-up one in Washington uh, as soon as possible. So we did one in Washington at the end of March. In fact, it was a, um, set up as an important precursor to the ICAO symposium in Montreal. Uh, it was endorsed, uh, as I said, coming out of the, the American uh, participants in the Melbourne workshop by the College of International Security Affairs, or CISA, at the US National Defence University. And again, sponsored by SSIT, CTAP, and this time we had uh, AESS come into it. RTI International uh, hosted the venue for us and also sent a number of participants. And DSI and the University of Melbourne were involved through my participation and, and one or two other people. So very quickly, the, the Melbourne workshop, uh, there was a, the idea of having it followed on from a uh, a one-day conference actually that was held at Flinders University in, um, in South Australia on unmanned airborne vehicles and public safety capabilities, uses and regulation. And um, it really focused on the civilian context and explored some of the implications for future use, primarily from the privacy issue perspective. And um, we felt that in the Australian chapter was a little bit narrow and it was uh, coming out of my role on CTAP uh, recognised as a hot topic, so we felt we needed to have a follow-up to uh, the Flinders um, uh, event, which um, considered more of the national security and the broader social implications, but not only the, um, the vehicle, but also the related technologies that go with it. Cameras, communications, well, payloads, what missions it can do, etc., etc. And um, it was sponsored by uh, the Carlton Connect 2014 conference uh, on challenges, partnerships and solutions held at the University of Melbourne um, straight after us. So we were at the, the event uh, two days before the conference and they provided all the facilities for us, so it was um, well timed. Okay, so what did we really talk about in that? Uh, we talked about the properties of RPABs uh, and, and the terminology here is vehicles where we've moved the systems and I'll talk about that later. Uh, we talked about the different types of uh, aircraft and systems currently being deployed or in development. Um, we talked about the challenges and risks posed by the personal commercial use of uh, RPABs. 
Uh, we talked about the safety regulations applied to manufacturer. Uh, we did have a very senior representative from the Civil Aviation Safety Authority of Australia uh, on our uh, panel. And um, we also looked at the um, surveillance missions and uh, how they impact on important social values in Australia and the United States. Uh, we actually had a, um, a senior member from IEEE USA who was also a research scientist at Los Alamos. And we had, um, who is now the Associate Dean of CISA of the National Defence University in the US, uh, come out particularly for this two-day workshop. So the two-day agenda considered the uh, uh, the RPAV is a platform, its mission capabilities of the platforms and their payloads, something that wasn't really you know, you know, looked into before. Okay, and also the integrity related technology to enable them to operate remotely. You know, um, how string, strong is the command and control technologies and can these be hacked, can they be used for malicious purposes um, and things like that. And particularly from a commercial, private but also a defence perspective. We also, at this workshop, had a senior member from the Australian Defence Force, uh, actually an Air Force officer at the group captain level. Okay, um, so there was a saying we uh, discussed the issue of operating integrity, uh, that's pilot capability, potential for incompetent, reckless, mischievous, malicious and criminal uses of RPAVs. So as you can see briefly there, it went far beyond the intent of the Flinders workshop. The three main outcomes, we recognise that there's a, you know, yeah, we need a universal vocabulary when we're talking about this technology uh, at all levels. And there's also a need for a clear and robust international framework, and I say international framework, for the certification of RPABs and licensing for their intended use. And while there are countless proposed uses across the vast range of RPABs, not all are appropriate. And, um, I'm touch on a bit that later on, but um, people come up with wonderful ideas how they can use uh, this technology, uh, but they have little appreciation of aerodynamics or the environment of really where they uh, can be used, which makes the uh, uh, potential use uh, inappropriate or, uh, or um, how can I say, um, not feasible. But anyway, if anyone wants to look into this further, the Melbourne workshop, it's uh, the workshop program information booklet with bios of the people um, who uh, participated and the summary report are available on the SSIT website at that link. And you can follow up. The um, proceedings for this workshop are still actually on my computer not finished unfortunately because um, my focus went straight out of completing this workshop straight into organising the Washington workshop. Now it followed pretty much the, uh, the same uh, model and program is the Melbourne one, but it was primarily for American audience, uh, obviously being held in, um, in Washington. And as I mentioned before, it was an pre, uh, important pre-event to the ICAO symposium in uh, Montreal. The object of both workshops was to produce a communique endorsed by the participants that will inform the preparation of agency reports and position papers for submission to the Australian and US governments and out of the Washington workshop came the position statement from IEEE USA and I will talk about that a bit in a second. Uh, just on the format, uh, as for the Melbourne workshop, participation in Washington was limited to 20 invited experts and members of the organising committee. So it was not thrown open to the public. We really went to people we saw as being experts and experts in the industry whose collective expertise covered you know, legal, insurance, regulatory, operators, military, civil and private, and technology, industry and academia. And um, obviously those people were recognised as experts in their field on technology development, manufacture, acquisition, operation and of the aircraft and related technologies. Okay, so uh, as with Melbourne, uh, the workshop considered the vehicle as a platform and uh, the uh, payloads and the integrity related technologies that enable them to operate remotely. We also consider potential for future developments in those technologies and capabilities, uh, particularly looking at uh, the ability for hostile agents to take control and autonomously direct the airborne systems uh, against the better interests of mankind. And uh, part of this was, I think most people have heard of MH370, uh, the aircraft, the Malaysian airline that was lost in the Indian Ocean. Uh, one of the theories out of that, it may have been, um, and, and obviously um, it's only a theory, um, that it may have been taken over by hostile agents and directed uh, on its uh, fatal path. 
Um, but it raised the issue about command and control and integrity, and um, because remote control vehicles um, are controlled from the ground, as distinct from necessarily pilot in the cockpit, um, there is much more potential for um, you know uh, an RPAB uh, to be overtaken by a hostile agent, and um, the consequences of that are quite horrific if you want to let your mind go a little bit. Also, the big issue in the US, uh, it was just after the Washington issue, was operator integrity. integrity, And um, we covered the whole spectrum again about incompetent, reckless, mischievous, malicious and criminal use of drones. And again, the need for robust legal and regulatory framework uh, across payloads types and communications. Again, uh, up on the uh, IEEE SSIT website is a copy of the Washington Workshop Program and Information Booklet. And uh, again, it contains the program and uh, the bio of, um, of the uh, 20 participants. I'm not quite sure we're going for time, but uh, very quickly, um, the CTAP position statement on RPAS, uh, I mentioned before that I am actually the SSIT member on CTAP. Uh, for those who are not aware of the committee, it provides poly policy advice on transport and aerospace policy to the US administration and Congress. So it's a fairly influential group coming from IEEE into that, um, that audience. The um, background position statement on unmanned aircraft systems and the reason for the title uh, on that is that up until only fairly recently, uh, most people have regarded as drones as being unmanned aircraft vehicles or unmanned aircraft systems. And we've in IEEE, um, we decided to introduce a part, as part of the position statement the need for change of vocabulary and terminology by starting off with the accepted title for the audience and leading them to what is now considered with the industry to be the more appropriate title of RPAS. Okay, so the background is uh, there's a lot of strategic trends and the development implications, yeah, and they're good and they're bad. Um, but what we, uh, what we can expect in the next decade that we bring into operation uh, in regards to the national interest uh, can raise many, many positive and negative um, issues. And um, what we did was distill these issues into three main elements, that of national security, economic prosperity, and social values. And um, I've mentioned before, I'm actually the author of this position statement, which went to the IEEE board for uh, sign-off in August 2015, only last month. And um, it was uh, being held over for a final sign-off to their next meeting, which is the first week of October, primarily because the IEEE president wanted the Robotics and Automation Society to actually have a look at and bless it. And one of the few people we, we, we missed in the, um, in the bidding process. So we expect it to be signed off um, on the uh, October meeting. Okay, so what do we mean by national security when it comes to this? And, um, you know, we, we have had, and I go back again saying we're tying this back to commercial drones and we know that there was uh, an unintentional, um, you know, uh, incident in the White House uh, several months ago. Um, so there's a, a big issue around um, national security. Uh, particularly if we look at the ability to weaponise these and some of the small, easily available, uh, commercially available um, drones or systems, as well as the development of high precision beyond line of sight control and navigation technologies. Um, I think there was even a, um, on, on our LinkedIn group, I, I'm a member of, uh, was commentary about um, a teenager playing around with his commercial consumer type aircraft by tying a, a, a gun to it and, and flying it and trying to fire it remotely and things like that. So it's pretty scary stuff what, what people are out there playing with, um, just thinking they're clever, let alone the people who are trying to do this deliberately for um, malicious purposes or criminal purposes. So in the right hands, uh, such capabilities can both enhance the defence of a nation and assets by dramatically reducing collateral civilian death as we see it um, used by um, our defence forces. But also in the wrong hands, it adds another dimension to terrorist attacks, whether they're lightweight loitering uh, or they're the big stuff. Economic prosperity. Um, and most people are aware of Amazon's intentions and, and various other people and how they want to use RPAs in a commercial context, right from individual real estate agents or photographers right up to major corporations like Amazon for all sorts of um, uh, commercial purposes. 
Uh, obviously, that's a, a large growth area uh, and would have you know, a, a large positive economic impact. Um, but it's only going to be limited by industry's imagination, the ability of regulations to enable that uh, to inhibit it. And you probably read many uh, articles, particularly in the US and, and internationally, uh, where regulators like FAA or CA UK or Cars in Australia, others, are still uh, wrestling with how to put regulations in place to cover particularly the small uh, RPASs. So the next point is that um, current air safety regulations at national, national levels are poor fit for the safety issues associated with RPAS operations uh, now while they are all being contemplated. Um, so we have a lot of people out there doing it uh, probably some people may say illegally or doing it without any sort of regulation guidance. Our next point is quite interesting. The uh, ARP has now an operation range in size from one ounce, uh, which is used for covert surveillance. Um, people might have the hummingbird or the wasp and things like that, to about 50 tonnes. And several international companies are well advanced their plans to deliver the service by remotely pilot aircraft. Um, the chair of CTAP was at a conference uh, just over 12 months ago and um, there was a presentation by a guy from FedEx and he said to him, well, how far away are you from having a 747 cargo drone flying from, say, you know, the US to Europe? And he said, well, 18 months if we had regulations and also the money to do it, but we have the technology. That's pretty scary stuff. Such developments are forcing regulators to urgently address these. I think that's, uh, I've covered it up before. Um, but then again, also, we have to look at uh, well, that's a positive scenario. There are many um, negative scenarios that can be used to threaten or even destroy national economic assets that would mount to blackmail on an industrial scale. So, you know, there are two sides to the argument for economic prosperity, and we don't want to inhibit the development of this technology for economic good, but we also have to realise that in developing that technology there could be a... Um, a, uh, a very serious negative impact as well on, on people being able to use that, uh, not in the national interest. Very quickly, social values. Um, this is uh, already, as I said, opportunity and, and con um, controversy. Um, most of the controversy is around the privacy issues and the regulators have said many times that um, the operation of um, drones, if you like, uh, or unmanned vehicles, is, is not really a regulatory issue. And uh, I think in Australia, when um, you buy a, um, an RPAS, you uh, get in the documentation with it that you need to be aware of the privacy laws that are in place by the Privacy Commissioner and others. So um, there's more of an awareness uh, responsibility through the regulators to, to people who buy it. Um, so that's a second bullet, third bullet point there. Um, also in this we recognise that um, uh, the technology advancements can really enhance the effectiveness of first responders and I think most people understand that as police, fire and, and ambulance but they equally have um, the potential for the same, same technology but uh, negative covert surveillance, uh, again, fueling the privacy bait. So just as much as we can put an aircraft up in the sky that provides an overview of an accident scene or a crime scene, you know, that technology is easily and readily available for someone to put it up over someone's backyard and um, you know, invade people's privacy or try to fire it over a um, sporting event. And um, there's been incidents of where uh, these have been operated by uh, private people recreation purposes, uh, where they've lost control of them and they've crashed down and in injured a marathon runner, for instance, and uh, you know, when it was captured on camera, the guy ran up, picked up his quadcopter and took off and didn't even tend assistance to the person who was knocked down, the runner who was knocked to the footpath on it. And, and equally, you know, um, while we, there's a lot of uh, looking at the ways we can dispatch, say, drugs from hospital to hospital or pharmacy to hospital or somewhere around the city area using RPAS. There's already been many attempts to fly drugs over the walls of prisons or over borders of countries um, in very much the same way. So the reason for taking the position in, uh, on the CTAP position statement, this is it's the supporting rationale. Um, while they can be an effective and efficient means of conducting particular operations for national security and social good, and they consider to have significant potential for a wide range of commercial applications, there are many risks and issues that need to be acknowledged and addressed. And we saw it as our responsibility in CTAP to put those on the table 
uh, and inform the US government about that. So we recommended that when they adopt policies for RPAS, that these policies balance the rights and responses of individuals with the public sector capabilities and private sector growth, as main saying the safety of the national airspace. Um, many instances also where recreational use of uh, people flying um, uh, RPAS is close to airports. I think the other day there were several reports of uh, pilots coming in, uh, bringing you know, passenger aircraft in and looking out at 2,000 feet seeing a drone just whiz past them, or they've been whizzing past a drone. So uh, it's pretty scary stuff. Um, so in our recommendations, uh, and I'll summarise these, I do have them in detail in slides to follow, but I won't go through them in detail. Um, we provided specific recommended policy considerations that will contribute to, to maintaining the safety of the national airspace, um, focusing on spectrum management for communications, the importance of command and control integrity, collision avoidance and um, uh, there's uh, nothing called uh, detect and avoid and this is not just between the RPAS and civil aircraft, it's between RPAS and RPAS because um, the, the pilot is just not with the aircraft. Importance of course was pilot operator skill and integrity and in many cases flying an RPAS for recreational purposes is not much different than driving your own car and the responsibilities that go with that. And the potential organisations such as in America, the Academy of Model Aircrafts, um, to uh, actually be involved in pilot training and accreditation because they have that established already for um, hobbyists in their remote control aircraft um, community. Okay, so um, there are 10 specific recommendations. I do have them in the slide pack. Uh, they are fairly detailed and um, in the interest of time I'm not going to go through them uh, individually but uh, this slide pack will be available for you if you uh, choose to either get a copy from the podium or download it. I think it's going to be, um, it's certainly going to be on the SSIT website within a day or two. Uh, these are, I'm not sure if it's going to be on the conference website but um, limitations there and if not email me and I'll send it to you. Okay, so I said I'm really not going to go through these in detail. I, I've summarised them just a minute ago. Very briefly now, I just want to talk about the um, ICAO Symposium. And uh, again, this is only about two or three slides. Um, the ICAO Symposium was more about, um, and, and ICAO is more about the manned or controlled airspace. So it's above the 500 feet. It talks about civil aviation, general aviation, man or piloted flight, if you like, but it does have provision in its um, uh, mandate to also con uh, to address unmanned vehicles or, or up, as they call it. And um, there are several ramifications that come out of what they consider uh, important for controlled airspace that flow back into the uncontrolled airspace or the below the 500 feet for small uh, aircraft, which fits back into the more of the consumer uh, drone market. You're not going to have a consumer drone for quite a while that's the size of a Cessna that you're going to fly around in, in managed airspace, and, unless you know, uh, you're pretty carried away. Um, so the context was that uh, is uh, pretty much the Chicago Convention in 44 uh, is where the adoption of both the uh, member states of ICAO and the airspace community on the Global Aviation Forum. Um, it's uh, strive to ensure that civil aviation may be developed in safe and orderly manner in the spare space, and as a preamble there. But they recognise that the RPAS uh, area is just growing rapidly around the work around the world. Okay, um, I'm going to try to actually pick out some of the key points on this slide, as I've put the detail here uh, for you to go back to. Um, this really puts it back to where it's covered in um, ICAO's uh, mandate and gives them some background reference. Uh, they have produced a um, systems manual uh, and a handbook, which I, I do have a copy of, but again, its focus is more on the controlled airspace. But um, we, we do have to understand that there's going to be some flow on into the, uh, into the more of the um, small drone area. Um, I will backtrack one bit, and it does come out of ICAO, so just bear with me on this. I did mention about terminology before, and it's actually this first recommendation that we had in that name. And um, essentially, terminology comes down to one thing. If it flies, it's an aircraft. 
there must be always a pilot responsible for the control of an aircraft, irrespective of the level of autonomy. Doesn't matter how far away removed, physically or in control, someone still needs to be in control of that aircraft and its flight. Whether you're the system operator who presses a button and it flies off autonomously, someone's had to have program it, someone has to initiate the flight. And an aircraft is recognised as a system of systems, including those associated with command and control. And for this reason, ICAO, and, uh, which the United States is a member state, chose the descriptor ARPAS over all the other terms in common use, your ASCAP and drone. The other part was that drone was considered to be sinister in a, in a, in a uh, well, two reasons, sinister in a defence or military context, or it was essentially considered to be one of ignorance um, in a more of the hobby area. So they wanted to actually emphasise well, you are dealing with a very complex technological system and a public safety issue. Okay, so I think um, I've got about five minutes left. The bar's not open for a while. I think. We're only holding up the chapter meeting, aren't we? So, uh, we're nearly finished. Um, these slides really just give you an indication of the um, layout of the symposium, just to give you an idea of what was discussed. Um, the website's still up if you want to go to it and have a look about who was there. But um, it did highlight these four topics of uh, a roadmap and guidance, uh, an industry vision of future operations, and the regulatory and oversight challenges facing the member states of ICAO and airspace and interim integration issues. And uh, I won't go into um, the uh, essentially agendas of, of the three days. Again, this is a link uh, to the uh, ICAO RPAS website if you'd like to know more, for, more information on that. And they have a really good um, eye kit up there for people who want to go into uh, and know a lot more about um, uh, what ICAO and the regulators are all thinking. Okay, I want to uh, end the presentation just by giving a bit of an overview of uh, a unique event that uh, happened in Dubai in February this year. Um, the competition ran from um, around about uh, October 2014. Uh, culminating in the um, final judging in Dubai in, in February. So uh, the award was uh, the vision of um, His Highness, uh, Sheikh um, uh, Al Makatum, uh, to make optimal use of innovation technology for the service of humanity. This competition, by the way, really uh, focused on consumer uh, drones from the point of view and how they work, as well as people building their own systems. So it was quite, quite unique. There are three categories. Uh, international competition, first prize of being in the US, um, and emphasise there the best use of civilian drones for improving people's lives, um, both bought off the shelf and applied or added to. Or, or built from scratch. National competition, a first prize of one million Durham uh, for the best drones for UA government services. And government entities was the first prize was a certificate, which felt pretty awkward after the others got a million dollars. Interestingly enough, we got over 800 entries from 57 countries, which was quite staggering, really, of people out there thinking about how they can use, um, you know, um, drones or unmanned vehicles uh, in a, um, for the good of civilian and improving people's lives. There were 39 semi-finalists who showcased the designs in Dubai from the 6th to 7th uh, before a panel of international judges, uh, of which I was very fortunate to be invited uh, as one, uh, including two of my colleagues from uh, SSIT. And the, um, the 2016 award uh, is now open. Entries closed on the 1st of November. And interestingly enough, this year, they also are running a parallel competition for robotics. Um, there was some discussion about drones and robotics, and they decided to um, run two competitions. And um, they are running in parallel. And the prizes, again, are uh, it's the same format, international, national, and government. I think the government may have been dropped off, but the prizes are still a million dollars. So if you've got an idea of how to use drones out there for the good of improving people's lives and one million million bucks, then um, get your entry in. Um, the winners from last year, uh, very quickly, the international competition was won by Flyability from Switzerland on a gimbal, uh, a very interesting device. And there's a link there to uh, how you can uh, see their presentation, the world's first collision anti-resistant drone rescue. Unfortunately, we don't have Wi-Fi, so all time, so I can't 
pull it up and show you, but it's, it's quite a fascinating um, piece of technology and how it's being used. Um, and, and basically it's a, a small um, quadcopter flying inside a gimbal cage and it flies along very slow and bounces off the walls and they use it to go into disaster sites and, and stuff like looking for victims and doing surveillance of damaged buildings where it's unsafe to get into and it's a very clever piece of work. The national competition was won by New York University in Abu Dhabi for their Wadi drone. Uh, this was fixed wing uh, drone that flew down through the canyons and uploaded data from the sensors that were tracking wildlife and poachers. And um, it, uh, the canyons, uh, or the Wadi, uh, which they call it, um, otherwise uh, they'd have to send a ranger down and sometimes he has to do it in 50 degree Celsius heat and takes several days. And uh, so, you know, they virtually flew the drone down in a matter of uh, two or three flights uh, over a couple of hours and uploaded all the data of someone was doing in extreme heat over many days. And um, the government Indians competition won by uh, Altasat for their network drone where they put up a couple of drones to give them a communications network during um, 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 uh, like a crime, not a crime scene, like an accident scene or something like that. Uh, and there's some links for more information on it. Uh, you can go and have a look at the finals, and uh, it's, it's quite interesting stuff. It's unique in its sense. It's the only competition in the world um, for uh, unmanned uh, well, drones uh, in this case. I'm trying to get away from calling it drones because uh, for the things I said before. And uh, that's it. I, I think um, I've raced it fairly quickly, and I do encourage you to get a copy of it if you're interested in this um, topic. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. I think there are questions. Nahum. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I was impressed with the amount of information that you presented in the short time. And I wonder, uh, could you summarize what are the three most important facts from your talk that you'd like us to remember? Okay. The, the big issue is, um, and it does come out in the recommendations, so, is uh, pilot identity. Um, I, I mentioned where the, uh, the, uh, the drone uh, was flown by a recreational person f uh, filming a marathon run and uh, it, he lost control of it for whatever reason and uh, it collided with a runner and, and uh, it was a lady and, and uh, nearly knocked her unconscious and things like that. The guy picked up and took off. I mean, no one knew, you can't trace him until so when it comes down to invasion of privacy or, or creating injury or harm. Um, it's very difficult, almost impossible, to trace down the owner to, to take legal action. So pilot identification is a big issue of, uh, of these, and uh, it, it's something that my company's uh, working on as well. Um, then there's the integrity of the pilot. So do we introduce licensing for this? And I mentioned before that um, while these may appear fairly simple piece of technology, it's being how they're used. When you may think about our cars and motorcycles and stuff like now, or, or, or our, some of the hobbies we engage in, like fishing, for various reasons, we, we have a license. Most of it is about skill of the operator. And, um, you know, it it's, takes a fair bit of hand-eye coordination, and particularly if we're going to allow um, you know, our passes to be operated beyond line of sight, which is really where the commercial operation wants to go, and a lot of hobbyists are already experimenting with that. And when we talk about line of sight, um, for something like it's about this big, you saw the photo, they're, they're pretty small, you only have to go a couple hundred you know, metres and you know, on a clear day even, and you can't see these things. But they are being flown much further beyond that under supposedly line of sight. And there is a height ceiling as well. So that's the second one is, is pilot um, operator integrity. The other third issue is um, there's a fair bit of ignorance in actually where you fly. Um, so having no fly zones. Now, uh, there are FAA regulations about how close you can fly an aircraft to a person. I think it's about 150 feet is as close as you can get. Uh, under, it doesn't matter whether you're on the ground or flying under um, um, civil aviation regulations, right? Unless that person is a, a, what they call an actor in the, in the mission. So if it's being used to make a movie and you want to get close to the scene and, and that, you can either have a good camera on it or you can fly in close. But that movie star is, or the person that's being filmed is an actor in the, in the operation. But if you're in a play, if you'll get children in a playground school or you're the marathon runner, and, um, or at a sporting event or whatever, 
and um, the vehicle comes within 150 feet of you is actually you know, breaking um, regula um, civil aviation regulations. Um, White House situation, there's a lot of talk about geofencing, how can we stop these things from operating where they shouldn't be operating around airports. Um, they're being flown where first responders are trying to fight fires or attend to an accident scene and private recreational people come along and want to film it get a, you know, uh, and get it up on YouTube or, or just for fun. Um, it's, it's a big issue, uh, not only from the privacy perspective, but um, becoming a, a nuisance, public nuisance to first responders. So the issue of um, uh, permanent and temporary no-fly zones and uh, going back with you know, education of, um, of pilots, is, uh, particularly of consumer drones, is, is a really big issue. So there are three main takeaways. Pilot, identifying, being able to identify the pilot, uh, being able to identify where the aircraft is actually being flown, uh, be a line site or, or, or line site, and being able to restrict where they can be flown in, in a way that um, doesn't Im impede uh, essentially um, uh, the growth of the industry from a commercial sense. Thank you. Any other questions? Gentlemen? Uh, I'm curious about infringement enforcement. Enforcement? <laughs> That's okay, I can hear. About infringement enforcement. Right. Because um, we can consider a lot of regulations that these devices have to have to comply, yep. but once these compliant devices are on air, yep. they can be out there together with others that are not compliant, and that must be policies. Yeah. L l let's say, and this is already happening because we see, for example, drones right. being used for drag drug traffic around borders. Right. So. Uh, w w what what is being discussed with respect to uh, yep. policy in the air for drones? Yep. Uh, about uh, uh, it's a good question, and there are essentially three levels of um, regulation, if you like, that that require enforcement uh, of any infringement against that. First of all, there's the national um, aviation laws like FAA, and I mentioned that uh, is a national rule about coming within 150 feet for example, or not flying it within five miles of an, air, of an airfield or an airport. Um, the problem is, right now, is identifying who owns the aircraft and who's flying it before you can even um, give them infringement notice. So that goes back to my first point. So we have to be able to identify the uh, infringer, both, uh, and this, even if you confiscate the aircraft, you still don't know who owns it. There's no, um, no registry of when you buy a car, you have the VIN number of your vehicle and it goes into an automobile registry, right? So even if they take the license plates off, or in most cases even stolen or burnt, they can still trace that what's left of it by the VIN number, unless that's ripped off, back to an owner. With, with, with uh, commercial drones, you can't. There's, there's no requirement, there's no law that says when you buy it, you have to register that with a, some agency or authority um, or even have a license for it in most cases. So that's the second challenge is, uh, you know, finding out who owns it. Um, and the third, what I meant before about levels, it's the federal, there's the state, and then there's the local authorities, right? So uh, state laws might say you can fly them in state parks, uh, but who's to say you can fly it over a person's property, your neighbour's property or not? There's no local law that, that says that. So we need to develop some of those regulations, and until they're in place, there's nothing to be infringed for. Right? You might get a complaint from a neighbour or someone about the noise or supposedly privacy, but unless it can be fell under some other law, I'll give an example. Privacy. In the US there's a law called the Peeping Tom Law. So if you're creeping around in your neighbour's or anyone's garden and peering through the window for whatever reason you're observing, right, and you're caught, you can be fined and charged and sent to jail or whatever under the Peeping Tom Law. So you think, okay, I've got an RPAS now or a drone and I've got a camera on it, I'll fly that out there even to 150 feet because it's got a really good camera on it, but the person in the house detects that it's out there and works out that it's yours and then gets the police to come round to your house and find you, they can still find you under the peeping Tom law because when we got legal advice in our workshops about how do we deal with this, about privacy, it's the intent, it's your intent of how you're going to actually break that law or do your spying on your neighbour or whatever. It's the same as if you're using it within a criminal 
case, like if you're robbing a bank or anything like that, and you're using a drone to help you in that, it still comes back to you as the person who did it, even though you've done it remotely, because it's your intent to commit the crime. So, but that's under existing laws, right? And there's a lot of scenarios out there that don't fall neatly within existing laws or regulations, and it makes it more difficult then to determine is this an infringement or is it not? At what level? And this is part of what the regulators and local law enforcement and, and legal people are wrestling with. And it flows back to insurance as well, because who's liable? So insurance companies are reluctant to license private operators and even small commercial operators because there's so much grey area in terms of liability, whether they pay out or not. And generally, if you want to get some insurance, it's going to cost you a fair bit because the risk is pretty high right now of them getting a remedy against you doing something right or wrong. So it's very difficult. Um, but there are systems, once we, once we um, solve the identity issue of it, being able to then issue infringements on um, flying it over the White House or Buckingham Palace or you know somewhere else, providing there's a law that says you can't do that, that would be much easier because we know who to find. We are at the time that there are thousands of drones flying outside. Yep. Some of them, they are the users are not licensed. Mm. On the streets, we can have officers, low, low officers that just stop the cars and they do the check. But these drones are on the air. Yep. That's right. Uh, how do we policy this? How do we enforce? How do, do we control that to, uh, they are uh, operating as they should? Right. So, going back to two things I, I mentioned before, and I'll be a bit clearer about it. Unless the city of Berlin says it's a no-fly zone, right, then there's no law to charge them against for flying a drone. So you have to bring in no drone law, like no smoking in restaurants, right, it's the same sort of thing. Or no driving your car over 35 miles an hour in a certain street, or something like that. Then and I don't know if it's in Germany or not, but I would imagine it is, how does a local police officer detect someone who's flying a drone that's um, flying over a school full of school children and obviously lower than 150 feet? He doesn't know anything about civil aviation law of 150 feet. He just says, oh, there's a guy flying a drone. Right? So there's a bit of ignorance down at the local level about national laws that probably could be fined about. And sometimes it's only uh, those infringements are only tracked and, and followed through on if someone like yourself makes a complaint and is knowledgeable that there must be a law around, even at the federal level, that can be invoked or fined against. So again, it's being able to detect that there is an infringement of a law that exists, enabled it to be then followed through on. Did I answer your question? Okay. It's very difficult, put that way. It's a really big issue about trying to control that. And that's why, to a large extent, it's out of control. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much.